at the University of Vermont, I organized a symposium that was dedicated to uh, new research uh, uh, on the question of the response of the German people to the persecution and mass murder of the Jews. That is to say, to the response at the time, between 1933 and 1945. And uh, uh, on and off for the last couple of years, I've been working with uh, the essays from that volume. Uh, and uh, the book is supposed to appear uh, in late 2015 or early 2016. What I thought I would do today is share with you some of the insights that the readers of this book will be able to attain about the subject of the German people and the Holocaust. On the 14th of November, 1938, four days after the nationwide Kristallnacht pogrom had brought devastation on the Jews of Germany, the chief of the Gestapo office of the northwest city of Bielefeld circulated a memorandum to the local secret police offices in the region. He was interested in collecting key pieces of information about the Kristallnacht pogrom and its consequences. Which synagogues had been destroyed by fire? Which had suffered severe damage? Which Jewish-owned businesses had been destroyed or damaged? And what was the financial extent of the damages? Which homes of Jews had been vandalized? Which Jews had been killed or injured? What property had been plundered from Jews? The Gestapo wanted to know who had uttered criticism of the pogrom, where they lived, and precisely what it was that they had said. Scientific surveys of popular opinion of the sort that we take for granted today did not exist in Germany in 19. 38. But this did not mean that the Nazi regime made no effort to keep track of what the population was thinking about a wide variety of questions, including the persecution of the Jews. One of the responses to the inquiry from the Bielefeld Gestapo office came from the mayor of a place called Amt Borgentreich, an administrative district consisting of several communities located in the triangle between Paderborn, Kassel, and Göttingen, north central Germany. Writing on November 17, 1938, so just about a week after the pogrom, the mayor summarized the situation in the following way. Quote, large segments of the population did not understand the operation or rather, they did not want to understand it. Some people felt sorry for the Jews. In particular, they felt sorry for them because their property was damaged and because male Jews were sent to concentration camps. To be sure, and this is still the quote, to be sure, these sentiments were not shared by the entire population. But I would estimate that around here, at least 60% of the population thought in this way." End quotation. On its surface, this document provides a useful piece of information in a, straight, in a fairly straightforward way. <coughs> but there are several respects in which the document points up the difficulty of assessing the responses of so-called ordinary Germans to the persecution of the Jews. First, it is probably impossible to ascertain whether the mayor's quantitative estimates rested on shoot-from-the-hip speculation or from a more serious consideration of the situation. I suspect it was the first, but there's no way to know. Second, it is extremely difficult to adjust for the possible biases that lay behind the mayor's estimate. Was he understating the extent of popular criticism of the pogrom in order to avoid creating the impression that he had failed to instill sufficient enthusiasm for Nazism in his population? Or was he exaggerating the extent of the criticism because he had considered the pogrom a foolish mistake by the regime's leadership? 
if we were to presume that his estimate was accurate, then what are we to make of it? Do we emphasize the 60% majority of the population that reacted to the pogrom disapprovingly, or do we focus on the very sizable 40% minority that did not respond negatively? Then there is the question of whether and to what extent Borgentraj may be considered typical, and if not, what peculiarities of the community may account for the actions and attitudes of its citizens. Even when we have a detailed contemporary document purporting to report systematically on public opinion, historians remain confronted by such perplexing questions of interpretation. Another example of how tricky these uh, issues can be with uh, historical sources uh, dealing with this question of German responses to the persecution of the Jews. At the time of the Kristallnacht, Lorva Balb was a 19-year-old woman living in Alze, a town located about 35 miles southwest of Frankfurt. Walb, who possessed literary and journalistic ambitions, kept a diary in which she recorded her impressions of the major events of the day. She was an admirer of the Nazi regime. Decades later, she would observe that she had been convinced that, quote, everything the Nazis did is correct, the National Socialist behaves honorably, is a good person, righteous, reliable, and truthful, end of quotation. She had embraced the truth of the Nazi slogan, quote, the Jews are our misfortune, and had acknowledged the necessity of marginalizing and persecuting them. After World War II, Laura Wall became a journalist in West Germany, retiring in 1979 after 20 years as director of the Women and Family Department of Bavarian State Radio. She published her diary that she had kept during the Nazi period in 1997. Rather than let the diary speak for itself, Walb engaged critically with her own record of events from the Nazi era. One question she put to herself almost 60 years after the event was why her diary for 1938 ended with an entry for November 6th. In retrospect, she recognized what had been her inability at the time to confront the terror against the German Jews. She had possessed full knowledge of what had taken place during the Kristallnacht of Rome and sensed that a great crime had been committed, but she was unable to process the information lest it undermine her entire orientation system, as she wrote later which had been based on a positive attitude toward Nazism. She was in denial. The distance between her ideology and her instinctive grasp of the wrongness of the pogrom generated feelings of shame. And the shame, in turn, resulted in silence. The momentous events of November 1938 simply remained absent from the diary. The Valve Diary offers important lessons for historians. Even such a so-called ego document, that's a term that we historians use nowadays to refer to documents written by historical actors that reflect their own thinking and their own uh, view of the world. Such a so-called ego document, which was not intended for publication at the time it was created, can contain significant discrepancies between what was witnessed and what was recorded. People withhold the truth not only from others, but also from themselves. And when they report on events in their diaries, <coughs> correspondence, or memoirs, they can do so in ways that are distorting, self-serving, or based on faulty memory. Scholars and students of all historical events should, of course, remain conscious of the strengths and limitations of their sources. 
But special vigilance is an order when examining the questions at the heart of the subject. How did ordinary Germans respond to the persecution and mass murder of the Jews between 1933 and 1945? What did they know? When did they know it? And how did they react? From the time of the Holocaust into the present day, these questions have generated intense and often emotional disagreements. When carried out in the public arena, such disagreements have often been based more on emotion and the received wisdom of collective memory than on a sober examination of the historical evidence. Communities of memory in many countries and across several generations have had a strong emotional stake in the question, and their perceptions have often been shaped by anger, guilt, and shame. As the Nazi period recedes into the past, however, the passing of generations offers the opportunity for a more sober and nuanced appreciation of this difficult history. The discrepancy between the historical significance of the topic on the one hand and the fragmentary nature of the evidence that is available to analyze it on the other has posed a continual challenge to scholars. Fortunately, historians have persisted in their efforts to find new and previously overlooked sources. When considering German responses to the persecution and mass murder of the Jews, it is important to remain very cognizant of the chronology and geography of the Holocaust. Between January 1933 and September 1939, Nazi measures directly affected only German Jews, as well as those who lived in areas annexed by the Reich in 1938, Austria and the Sudetenland region of Czechoslovakia, as well as Jews in the Reich Protectorate established over the Czech lands of Bohemia and Moravia in 1939. Accounting both for the emigration of German Jews after 1933, as well as for the acquisition of these new territories, the number of Jews subjected to direct Nazi control hovered at around half a million throughout the pre-war period. It was only with the advent of World War II in Europe in September 1939 that the number of Jews under German control grew from the hundreds of thousands into the millions. During the pre-war period, Nazi Jewish policy radicalized over time. After the Nazi takeover of the German government in 1933, Jews were subjected to economic boycotts, expelled from a variety of professions, <coughs> deprived of German citizenship, and placed under pressure to have their property, uh, quote unquote, Aryanized, that is to say, transferred to non-Jewish Germans. This process of marginalization was carried out in a legal and bureaucratic fashion, although it was accompanied by a good deal of humiliation, intimidation, and waves of genuine violence. The Kristallnacht pogrom, which we've already talked about, saw violence on an unprecedented level, with the mass destruction of synagogues and Jewish-owned businesses, widespread physical attacks on Jews in their homes and on the streets, and the arrest of about 30,000 Jewish men who were transferred to concentration camps. One way of looking at it is that there were two categories of anti-Jewish measures carried out in Nazi Germany. There were legal anti-Jewish measures and illegal anti-Jewish measures. The purge of Jews for many occupations, the deprivation of their citizenship, their deprivation of their rights, these and other measures were all mandated by uh, law. They were carried out according to regulations that were systematically placed on the books and implemented by civil servants and so forth. It was legal doesn't make it right, but as we know, there's a difference between being legal and being right. So this was the legal part of anti-Semitism. The illegal anti-Semitism is the violent acts. Uh, in Germany in 1938, at the time of the, 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 the Kristallnacht pogrom, it was illegal to break into your neighbor's house and beat somebody up and steal their property. It was tolerated, it was 
inspired by the regime. It was even, in some cases, organized by the regime, but that didn't necessarily uh, make it uh, legal. After the outbreak of war in September 1939, the Jews who remained in Germany were removed from their homes and compelled to live in segregated apartment buildings or other facilities, also legal. They were also subjected to forced labor, also legal. Beginning in 1941 and extending into the following year, the majority of German Jews were deported to ghettos and camps in Poland and the Baltic region, where most of them uh, died or were murdered. German Jews who survived the Holocaust fell mainly into several categories. Those who lived in uh, privileged mixed marriages with their so-called Aryan spouses and were therefore never deported those who managed to go underground and escape deportation, those who were deported initially to the Theresienstadt ghetto, but managed to avoid subsequent deportation to Auschwitz, and those who were selected for forced labor in Eastern Europe and were fortunate enough uh, to escape the gas chambers uh, and also survive the forced labor. The measures targeted at German Jews after the onset of the war unfolded roughly in parallel with the persecution of Jews in countries occupied by or allied with Germany. By the early summer of 1941, about two million Jews were subjected to compulsory ghettoization and forced labor in German-occupied Poland. Policies of persecution were implemented across German-dominated German Europe. Information about these developments was by no means kept secret from the German population. The Nazi regime initiated the systematic mass murder of Jews upon its invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941. These killings took the form of mass shootings carried out by mobile killing units, Einsatzgruppen, across a large swath of territory in eastern Poland, the Western Soviet Union, Ukraine and white Russia, and the Baltic states. In this first phase of the so-called final solution, German special task forces organized and carry out, carried out the killings, often receiving the significant, significant assistance from local militias whose members were motivated by a combination of anti-Semitism and an eagerness to ingratiate themselves with their new German overlords. These killings were often carried out in secret but it has been well documented that information about them leaked back into Germany. This fact was recently confirmed dramatically by the publication of the wartime diary of Friedrich Kellner, a court civil servant in the small Hessian town of Laubach, the diary of Friedrich Kellner from the years 1939 <coughs> to 1945, was published in 2011. On the 28th of October, 1941, Kellner made the following entry in his diary. A soldier on leave reports to have been an eyewitness to horrible atrocities in the occupied region of Poland. He watched as naked Jewish men and women who were lined up in front of a long deep ditch were shot at the base of their skulls by Ukrainians at the order of the SS and fell into the ditch. The ditch was then shoveled closed. Screams still came out of the ditch. Kellner was convinced that, quote, 99% of the German population bears indirect or direct guilt for the present situation. The information about the massacres was available to Kellner, who lived in a small provincial town so it was also available to millions of other Germans. So the debate revolves not around whether Germans could have known about the final solution, but more around other questions. How widespread was such knowledge? The information sufficed for Germans to understand that the massacres were part of a systematic program of mass murder, right? Everybody knows that atrocities happen in war. Did, they, did people have enough systematic information to know that this was part of a, a program? 
to what extent were Germans distracted by other war-related issues? Through what kinds of psychological mechanisms did Germans avoid, repress, or deny such information? In 1942, the mass murder program expanded to include all of the Jews of Europe. In this new phase of the final solution, the killing was shifted from mass shooting by mobile forces, mobile task forces, to a more centralized, industrialized process based at extermination camps in German-occupied Poland. A team of German officials, coordinated by Adolf Eichmann, organized the deportations of Jews from their home countries to the killing sites. Deportations on such a scale could hardly be carried out in secret, and knowledge about them was widespread across Europe. Here, the key question for historians is not whether ordinary Germans knew of these deportations, they obviously did, but rather whether they comprehended the ultimate fate of the deported Jews, and to the extent that they did, how did they react? In Germany, after World War II, the refrain, we didn't know about it, davon haben wir nicht gewusst, was often invoked when the subject of the mass murder of Jews was raised. Uh, this is an assertion that can be assessed on the basis of concrete historical evidence. And so let me uh, now turn to a discussion of some of the individual studies uh, of these questions that uh, will appear in uh, this uh, book. The first example I'd like to talk about is a work by the German scholar Frank Bayor. He's one of the leading historians of the Holocaust uh, in Germany today. In the uh, chapter that he contributed to my volume, compares and contrasts three published collections of documents. The first set of documents Bayor refers to as regime internal reports, or reports internal to the regime. What we're talking about here is a set of slightly under 4,000 documents collected from a large number of German archives as part of a joint German-Israeli project. The second collection of documents that Bayor deals with consists of consular reports filed by foreign diplomats stationed in Germany. As you could imagine, a very large number of foreign diplomats stationed in Germany between 1933 and 1945. The third collection that Bayor deals with in this essay was published in 1980. It consists of reports written by the German Social Democratic Party in exile. The German Social Democratic Party was banned in 1933, but there was a party office in exile and the party maintained a network of informants in the country who recorded their impressions of the responses of the German population to various issues of policy, and then they secreted these reports out to Prague and other places and so forth. Bayer argues, all three sets of reports agree upon the existence of a general anti-Semitic consensus in German society. And at the same time, agree that there was widespread rejection in German society of anti-Jewish violence. The contribution to this volume by uh, Professor Peter Fritsche, who is a very prominent historian of Nazi Germany, the title of his contribution to the volume is itself uh, indicative of the argument, and that is Babi Yar, but not Auschwitz. What did Germans know about the final solution? And it's based on a careful, a very close reading of diaries kept by Germans uh, during the Nazi era. I'm talking about non-Jewish Germans who lived through the Nazi era, kept diaries and published them after the war. In his piece, Fritsche offers a detailed analysis of popular responses to Nazi Jewish policy uh, plotting these responses against the chronology of deportation, uh, mass murder, and the Allied bombing of German cities. 
He grounds his argument in an analysis of the complex interrelationship among four different categories of knowledge. The first of these categories of knowledge was the widespread knowledge within Germany of the massacres of Jews that took place in Eastern Europe in the second half of 1941. The most famous of which is probably Bobby Yar. These were mass shootings of Jews. The second category of knowledge was the even more widespread knowledge of the mass deportation of German Jews to that region, to Eastern Europe, in starting in late 1941 and extending into 1942. The third category of knowledge was the experience of the Allied bombing of Germany, which over time, according to Fritzsche, eroded knowledge of the final solution, and also fueled Germans' fantasies of Jewish revenge, that is to say, the more the bombs uh, fell on Germany, the more Germans came to believe this was a form of Jewish revenge. And the fourth category of knowledge that he analyzes was the official propaganda campaign carried out by the Nazi regime in the year 1943, in which the mass murder of Jews was tacitly acknowledged tacitly acknowledged in the regime's warnings about the potential catastrophic consequences of a German defeat. Fritzsche arrives at the conclusion that ordinary Germans possessed extensive knowledge of the final solution, but that this knowledge was incomplete and, in his word, deformed by the convergence of factors I mentioned above. Germans, he argues, knew more about the mass executions of Jews by the Einsatzgruppen, the mobile killing operations, in 1941 and 1942, than they would learn about the subsequent killings uh, in the uh, extermination camps. So when, when the key question is asked, you know, did Germans know about it? It all, as Bill Clinton would say, it depends on what the meaning of it is. <laughs> Quote, large segments of the population did not understand the operation, or rather, they did not want to understand it. Some people felt sorry for the Jews. In particular, they felt sorry for them because their property was damaged and because male Jews were sent to concentration camps. To be sure, and this is still the quote, to be sure, these sentiments were not shared by the entire population. But I would estimate that around here, at least 60% of the population thought in this way. End quotation. On its surface, this document provides a useful piece of information in a, straight, in a fairly straightforward way. <coughs> but there are several respects in which the document points up the difficulty of assessing the responses of so-called ordinary Germans to the University of Vermont, I organized a symposium that was dedicated to uh, new research uh, uh, on the question of the response of the German people to the persecution and mass murder of the Jews. That is to say, to the response at the time, between 1933 and 1945. And uh, uh, on and off for the last couple of years, I've been working with uh, the essays from that volume, uh, and uh, the book is supposed to appear uh, in late 2015 or early 2016. What I thought I would do today is share with you some of the insights that the readers of this book will be able to attain about of the pogrom, where they lived, and precisely what it was that they had said. 
scientific surveys of popular opinion of the sort that we take for granted today did not exist in Germany in 1938. But this did not mean that the Nazi regime made no effort to keep track of what the population was thinking about a wide variety of questions, including the persecution of the Jews. One of the responses to the inquiry from the Bielefeld Gestapo office came from the mayor of a place called Amt Borgentreich, an administrative district consisting of several communities located in the triangle between Paderborn, Kassel, and Göttingen, north central Germany. Writing on November 17, 1938, so just about a week after the pogrom, the mayor summarized the situation in the following way persecution of the Jews. First, it is probably impossible to ascertain whether the mayor's quantitative estimate rested on shoot-from-the-hip speculation or from a more serious consideration of the situation. I suspect it was the first, but there's no way to know. Second, it is extremely difficult to adjust for the possible biases that lay behind the mayor's estimate. Was he understating the extent of popular criticism of the pogrom in order to avoid creating the impression that he had failed to instill sufficient enthusiasm for Nazism in his population? Or was he exaggerating the extent of the criticism because he had considered the pogrom a foolish mistake by the regime's leadership. If we were to present the subject of the German people and the Holocaust, on the 14th of November, 1938, four days after the nationwide Kristallnacht pogrom had brought devastation on the Jews of Germany, the chief of the Gestapo office of the northwest city of Bielefeld circulated a memorandum to the local secret police offices in the region. He was interested in collecting key pieces of information about the Kristallnacht pogrom and its consequences. Which synagogues had been destroyed by fire? Which had suffered severe damage? Which Jewish-owned businesses had been destroyed or damaged? And what was the financial extent of the damages? Which homes of Jews had been vandalized? Which Jews had been killed or injured? What property had been plundered from Jews? The Gestapo wanted to know who had uttered criticism